Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd shep separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me, naked and you clothed me ill and you cared for me in prison and you visited me then the righteous will answer him and say lord when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you and when did we see you ill or in prison and visit you and the king will say to them in reply amen i say to you whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine you did for me then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs, he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Jesus Christ. So the last Sunday of the year is always, the 34th Sunday is always the Feast of Christ the King. Next Sunday we begin the Advent season, the four weeks of preparation for the birth of Christ. And today the Feast of Christ the King is a, a great a great feast where we remember that Jesus is our universal Lord and King and will be forever and ever. If I were to ask you, in the, in the Bible, in the life of Christ, who was the one person who first recognized his divine kingship? Who was the first person in the Bible who recognized the divine kingship of Jesus Christ? And uh, I will answer that question for you by the end of the homily. We remember the story, the song as we were growing up, especially on Palm Sunday, the King of glory comes, the nation rejoices, open the gates before him, lift up your voices. And so that hymn reminds us, doesn't it, that even when Jesus was walking, going into Jerusalem, remember on Palm Sunday, astride a donkey, what were people saying? Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the king. So you might say, oh, those were the people who recognized. No, some of those same people a few days later were yelling, crucify him. They did not recognize who Jesus was and what his kingship really meant. St. Paul, we read in 1 Corinthians 15, says that while Christ's kingdom is achieved now in space and time, it is also not yet. It won't be fully culminate until the Lord comes again on the clouds of heaven. It's around us, the gospel we just read, right? Matthew 25. And Jesus will say, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. So where's the kingdom of God right now? Jesus would say, the kingdom of God is among you. And they were, everyone would look around. Like, where is the kingdom of God, this church? As much as we love our churches and their beautiful part of our life, the kingdom of God is in the human heart kingdom of God is people who put Christ on that throne in their heart and they live for him and they love him and they obey his teachings 
That's the kingdom of God. If every church were torn down, the kingdom of God would be just as strong because the kingdom of God is the people of God who are joined to him through his love and his grace. We grow up in the United States, and of course, in the United States, it's hard for us to understand a theology of Christ as king just because our experience is democracy, isn't it? In the U.S., it's the vox populi, right? The voice of the people that determines the law of the land. But we have to remember, democracy is relatively new on the world political scene. You remember from your studies of history and political science, the world's ancient kingdoms were filled with monarchies, weren't they? Kings that claimed to wield absolute power. They claimed to rule by divine right, which meant my kingship comes from God himself. And they believed they had the right to make any kind of a law, even to taking the life of others. And they believed there were no limits to that. Now, we all know that the truth is that all power comes from God. He lends it to us. And we will be responsible and answer for how we have used the power that he has lent to us. And that's why we must always use the power God gives us with kindness and gentleness, with the, the well-being of others in mind. We have a little joke in, in seminary work that we say that some men who come to the seminary are, uh, are, are theocracy, when that word means called by theos, God. Those are the kind we want, right? Some people come to the seminary, they, we, we'll joke and say they are um, democracy, called by the people, which means maybe it's their mother's vocation, right? And he said, but the ones we really have to watch out are those that are autocracy, those who call themselves, because you can't call yourself to be a priest. God has to call us. And we all know that, by and large, ancient monarchs, kings, did not have good reputations. They were filled with abuses. They used their power and wealth for their own comfort and glory. They waged war, spilled blood, and their power was wielded arbitrarily and unjustly, and mostly people despise them, but not so Jesus. Jesus is a different kind of king entirely. How many kings in your history books were born and, and laid in a, in a stable, in a manger? How many kings ended their life on a cross, never stepped foot in a palace, and wore a crown of thorns? How many kings were also shepherds? Only one in the whole Bible, King David, which is why he's the prototype of the Messiah. Because Jesus is a king who loves his people so much, he pours himself out to care for us. Because he's a father. He's a king who's also a father. If you grew up Catholic, you remember, especially if you remember from the Latin times, you remember that word dominus, we, the priest would say, Dominus Vobiscum, right? The Lord be with you. And the people would say, Et cum spiritu tuo, and with your spirit. And that word Dominus in Latin does mean Lord or Master, but it also means to build, like to construct, as in a house. So the word is often associated with kingship. Don't we say that a king has dominions, right? That he has dominance over? We use that word Dominus to refer to kings as well as to building, because Jesus is building something here. He is building the kingdom of God in the hearts of his people. How is Jesus a king? Well, first of all, he's omnipotence. He has supreme absolute power, and yet he rules like one who is lowly and humble of heart. He's not arrogant. As powerful as he is, he uses his power very gently with us, doesn't he? He's very merciful which is wonderful, he even pours out his life for us. But secondly, as I said, he, he cares for his people like a shepherd, the good shepherd. We read from Ezekiel talking about that very thing, is that like a father to children, which is why David was the prototype. Thirdly, he teaches us right. He's a king because he teaches us right from wrong, models it on his own life and death. He shows us how to be good and how to be happy. He shows us if we live as Christians, our hearts are filled with joy. And finally, he does judge us in the end when he comes at the end of the clouds, Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven surrounded by his angels. He separates the sheep from the goats. He judges us in the end. What about the, uh, the Pharisees who said to him, uh, the high priest who said to Jesus at his trial, 
I adjure you to tell me, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And what did Jesus say? I am. But he didn't claim to be a king. The high priest did not know he was a king. What about Pilate? Pilate was concerned about kings because he was a civil. And so Pilate said to him, are you a king? And what did Jesus answer? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If it did, there would be a, a legion of angels here to protect me. He didn't say he was not a king, did he? But he answered the question saying, my kingship is much greater than this puny little Roman empire. My kingship is the whole universe, all people's past, present, and future. So he said, then what, who are you? He said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. And what did Pilate say? Truth. What does that mean? Jesus is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Now the answer to the riddle is when Jesus was crucified between two thieves. One of the thieves we traditionally call Saint Dismas. We assign that name to him. And Saint Dismas, crucified next to Jesus, turned to him and said what? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Saint Dismas the good thief was the first person in the Bible to truly recognize it wasn't obviously, it wasn't an earthly king, kingship. They were both about to be dead. He understood that he was a divine king, a great king who will live forever. In New York, there's a prison, a famous prison. It's called Clinton Prison. And the prisoners that's been there for many, many years, the prisoners who are in that Clinton prison for life, who've done crimes that gave them life sentences. They were able to build and establish a chapel many years ago called St. Dismas, the Chapel of St. Dismas. Now, for your Catholic trivia for the day, this is the only freestanding chapel in a federal prison anywhere in the United States. The Chapel of St. Dismas in Clinton Prison in New York. And the reason? Because the good thief who was also crucified, he knew he was never going anywhere. He recognized Jesus as a king. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Incidentally, the red oak pews that are magnificent red oak in uh, that St. Saint, Saint Dismas Chapel in Clinton Prison were actually donated by the gangster Lucky Luciano, who was a prisoner there in the 1930s. There's your Catholic trivia for the day. Today the Lord reminds us that the word anointed, Christus, Christ, means anointed. Do you know how they made kings? They anointed them. They poured oil on top of their heads. The, the very name of Jesus means king, doesn't it? The king of the universe. So on today, on the Feast of Christ the King, one of the things I think is so important to talk about is our use of power. What do I mean by that? I mean that every person in this church has been given a certain amount of power over other persons. You know, maybe if you're a mom or a dad, of course you have power over your children. You're supposed to guide them and protect them. Uh, husbands and wives have power over one another because of the, the intimacy of their relationship. That's very true. You know, as a priest, I have power over, like, my different jobs, and I have to be very careful how I make decisions. And I want you to think about, I, I went to supper one night with a lovely Catholic family, and they had about five children, and the littlest one was about two years old and um, three years old or so, and uh, she kept saying to the dog, sit, and the dog would obey her, and the mother looked at me and said, the dog is the only one she has power over in this family, so she likes to use that command as often as she can, you know, um, but she was talking about that whole idea that God, we are stewards of the power God has given to us. We, we will answer for it. We will answer. The power God gives us is not to be used arbitrarily and selfishly. It's to be used with the people of God, with others in mind. And, of course, the Lord reminds us that he wants us to take care of the poor. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. Thirsty, naked, homeless. The Lord expects us to care for others. And the smaller, the least important someone is in the eyes of the world, the more important they are in the eyes of God. 
the least important someone is in the eyes of the world, the more important they are in the eyes of God. So we end today reminding that the kingdom of God is already but not yet, as the catechism says. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said that. It's among us. It's in your hearts. It's among God's people all over the world. But the real kingdom of God will never be complete until the Lord Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven at the end of time. And on that day, we will then see God who is all in all. The kingdom of God will be a glorious place to spend eternity. I want to end with a, it's a famous Negro, the, the words, the lyrics of a, a famous Negro spiritual which speaks about these things. And the words go like this. There's a king and captain high, and he's coming by and by. And he'll find me hoeing cotton when he comes. You can hear his legions charging across the regions of the sky. And he'll find me hoeing cotton when he comes. There's a man they thrust aside who was tortured till he died. And he'll find me hoeing cotton when he comes. He was hated and rejected. He was scorned and crucified. He'll find me hoeing cotton when he comes. When he comes, when he comes, he'll be crowned by saints and angels when he comes. They'll be shouting out Hosanna to the man that men denied. And I'll kneel among my cotton when he comes. And wherever we are on that day, we will also kneel and proclaim, long live Christ the King. Amen.